I caught this funny story on camera. It's about St. John's College from the University of Cambridge. I don't know if the story is true, but here you go. So if you look to my left here, there's a black door. This door is used for, it was used for loading goods. However, recently some of the older students at St. John's played a prank on the younger ones. So they moved all the fire engine signs around and pointed them towards this door. And then set the fire alarm off. So that one by one, the younger students all ran out into the river. Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. It is another Coding Diaries video and as per usual we're doing a system design exercise together. But before that there's a few other things that I want to show you. I added some lights to my bed and I also added these new flowers over here. There were some holes in the wall because this bed frame was much higher up and it was being supported by a wood thing that was screwed to the wall. And one day this suddenly fell down because the holes were simply, like this is not a real wall, this is something else which I forgot the name of, but yeah, it's not a real wall. They didn't use like the proper materials to do this and then it simply fell off. <laughs> so now I have my bed frame on the floor and I have three big holes over here. So what I did was I bought some fake flowers and I simply stuck them in the wall. Since I work at Prime Video, I thought it would be interesting to look into typical architectures for streaming platforms, so I thought that we could design Netflix together. Do keep in mind that this is more of a generic, very high level design. We won't go into a lot of detail. Obviously, Netflix is not something that you can design in an hour, or it's not the type of architecture that you could completely get right uh, in an interview. But the idea is just to get a high level overview of what is required when you're building a streaming platform and what is sort of the right direction to go into. And as per usual, I prepared some notes because I'm a nerd and I like this stuff. Let's start by listing out the requirements of our version of Netflix. In our system, users can watch videos, which would be movies or shows, and videos are uploaded internally by employees. So the uploading is not facing the user. The system should have smooth streaming we expect it to have 2 million daily users. Each user watches on average one hour of content per day. We want the system to be scalable, available and reliable. And we're going to consider that downloads are out of scope. Given our requirements, I would suggest that there are three main subsystems. One of them is the video streaming system. So the system that would provide the content to the user. Then we need an internal video upload system where employees can upload the content to the platform. And then we should have our REST APIs. And this is for stuff such as subscription and user management, the recommendation feed, etc. Out of these subsystems, the ones that are very specific to streaming platforms are the first and the second. So those are the ones that we're going to focus on. Having 2 million daily users watching an average of one hour of content per day, that means we're streaming on average 2 million hours of content per day and we need to do so in a very smooth and reliable way. When we're streaming content, it usually starts streaming immediately and we don't have to wait until the download is complete. When a video is downloaded, that means that it is on our device and we are consuming it from the device. When the content is being transferred from a remote server in every instance, then that is streaming. So if we're streaming, we continuously receive data from a remote server. So one thing that is very important is to pick the right streaming protocol. These protocols are very niche and it's not knowledge that everyone needs to have unless you're actually building something like this. But just out of curiosity, I looked them up. Some of the most famous ones are HTTP Live Streaming, Microsoft Smooth Streaming, Adobe HTTP Dynamic Streaming, and finally also Dynamic Adaptive Streaming over HTTP. Each protocol has pros and cons, and it's important to pick the right one for our use case because it influences the different encodings and also, I believe, the playback player that we can use. Once we pick the protocol, it's time to look into the most important component of streaming video, and that is the CDN. A CDN is basically a network of servers that are dispersed all over the world and they are used to cache static content that doesn't typically change over time, such as obviously movies and shows. So when a user requests to watch a movie, it sends a request to the CDN and the geographically nearest edge server will stream the movie to the user. If for some reason the movie is not cached in the CDN, 
it retrieves it from the origin. However, the whole point of having a CDN is that the content is cached and it's geographically close to every user, so it reduces the latency and we don't have to actually get it from the origin. If we were to actually do this, we would obviously use a third-party CDN, we wouldn't create our own CDN, and I believe in CDNs you usually pay per the amount of data that is sent through the CDN. So this is pretty straightforward. We use a CDN and that is how we cache the content, that is how we reduce the latency, and that is how we stream it to the user. Now let's look at the video uploading feature. So a proposal for video upload would be something like this. So an internal user wants to add a new movie to our platform's content selection. So an upload request is sent to an API, which in turn uploads the video to blob storage. And blob storage means that you have uh, a data lake which stores data in binary format. A good example of that is Azure blob storage or Amazon S3, if I'm not mistaken. I believe you can store binary format data in S3. Once the video is uploaded, an upload completion event is queued so that it can be consumed by the transcoding servers. This layer here is responsible for transcoding a movie into the format that is required for the CDN. And this queue over here is so we can decouple both of these parts of the system. This way we don't risk throttling the servers and we also don't risk missing out on any information. Once the file is transcoded over here, there are two things that happen. It is enqueued in another queue and then it is persisted to the data lake in the right format. So this is the transcoded content. This data lake will serve as the origin for the CDN. And at the same time, we should also have a database with the metadata of all the content that is available on the platform. So we should make sure that we update the metadata to know that we have this content now available. So once the transcoding is done, we need to persist it to the data lake. And then we also send the message into another queue where we will have a metadata handler that consumes this message and makes sure to update the metadata database. This is sort of a module that will persist the metadata associated to the movie. And that is, for example, the ID, the URL details, the resolution, um, the file size, etc. I believe there should be a cache here to reduce the reload on the database. And this cache will then have to be updated as well when we write to the database. And then we should have an API that notifies the user when the upload is complete. And this would be my very high level, very simplified design proposal for a streaming platform. I hope you learned something because I for sure did when I was doing the research. Making myself some lunch now. This is gnocchi filled with mozzarella and cheese. No, sorry, spinach and mozzarella. <laughs> mozzarella and cheese. And it's really good. I have some news to share. Something really cool happened recently and I have you guys to thank for it. As you know, I started learning how to code back in 2019 and a while ago I did a video and I posted it on TikTok where I was describing and sharing all of the resources that I used to learn to code. As you know, I did career paths from Code Academy and Code Academy themselves found my video and they invited me to be sort of a brand ambassador for them. This is such a pinch me moment for me because I always really liked their platform and it helped me so much that it's such an honor to, to represent them in a way. It feels a bit like coming full circle for me because if I hadn't started programming, I probably would have never started creating content online. So it's so strange that all of this sort of ties back to this one day in March 2019 when I randomly decided to do a Code Academy JavaScript course just for fun. I'm literally living in a different country, working in a completely different industry, I have way more flexibility in my job and I'm also doing this YouTube channel which is not something that you would expect from someone like me because I'm quite introverted. And I am lucky to have this platform and I don't take it for granted at all and I thank you so so much for watching my videos and supporting this channel. So in upcoming videos I will be showing you guys a bit more of the courses that I took and that I still take. I still have a Code Academy subscription. I am working on a video showing the exact roadmap that I took to learn programming and I hope that it will be helpful for you. But yeah, the reason I chose Code Academy at the time was because I simply googled like the best online platforms to get started with coding and Code Academy had really good reviews and feedback. They were one of the first educational coding platforms out there. I think they started in 2011. 
And their UI and environment is really cool because it's very engaging and it doesn't feel like you're doing a lecture. They offer two types of courses. There are skill paths and there are career paths. The skill paths are for upskilling or gaining specific knowledge in a certain domain. Whereas the career paths, they are bigger self-paced courses that have quizzes and assignments and real-world projects. And the whole aim of these career paths is to get us prepared for an entry-level role at a certain career. They offer certifications for their courses, which is always helpful, and they have also content to prepare us for technical interviews, as well as some supporting teachers we can reach out to. There is a seven-day free trial, so anyone can give it a go before making a decision. Therefore, if you're interested in upskilling in a certain area or landing a job in a tech field, I can definitely recommend them from my own experience. So best of luck, and I hope you like them if you decide to try them out. Let's talk about books. As you saw in the video, it was my birthday recently and this year I treated myself to some books. After reading Fourth Wing, which is this fantasy novel about dragon riders and the war college, I was just really in the mood to read books. And I'm currently very deep in a fantasy reading phase, so I treated myself to some more books to keep me busy. One of these books is non-fiction, and it's this one about manifesting. It has a little bit of that wishy-washy, clickbaity, living my best life vibe, but if you can look past that, it actually has some really nice insights and some good practical steps to be more optimistic and positive and to also, I don't know, I guess be more grateful for what you do have in life. And I like that. So it's a good book. I enjoyed it. I read it already. Then I got A Dark Inheritance. Oh my God. Then I got A Dark Inheritance. This is a fiction book about a boy who is about to turn 18 and his three older brothers all died on their 18th birthday and he's convinced that there's some sort of like curse on their family and that he's gonna die on his birthday and he's like doing all he can to avoid it. I know we're not supposed to judge a book by its cover but this cover in my opinion is very well made. It sparks your interest, it gets you curious, it gives... it doesn't give much away but gives you enough to get like interested in the story so that's why I bought it. And then I have One Dark Window. I absolutely love this. It's just amazing. It's a dark, gothic fantasy romance, and it's about a girl who has a spirit trapped in her head, and the magic system of this universe is quite interesting. It works with cards. It's quite unique based on what I've seen around and what I read in the past, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think it's a beautiful book, it's very poetic, it's very well written and it really keeps you engaged and I just couldn't put it down. I really liked it, can recommend. Then I got this one, How to Kill Your Family. I got this because the title sort of like appealed to me. Not that I want to kill my family, not at all. I guess it's just like an interesting title for a book. When I was at the bookstore, a girl next to me was talking to her friends and telling everyone that this book is amazing and that she really liked it. And in that precise moment, I had the book in my hand and I was like listening to what she was saying because I wanted to know her opinion. She looked like sort of a bookworm. And then she saw that I had the book in my hands and then we both laughed because I ended up buying it because of her recommendation. A Darker Shade of Magic. This book is about magicians who I believe travel in between parallel universes and it takes place in London. Um, it's gonna be my first book by this author, V. Schwab. She's all around the bookstores right now. She has published quite a lot of books and everyone says that she's a really good writer. So I'm super excited to get started on this one. It's the first of a trilogy, so I'll be probably buying the other two as well. I can't wait. And then lastly, I bought Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. They say that this book is incredible. It has won awards and it has been recommended to me left and right. So I decided to get the hardcover because it's a very 
pretty book. It's not a fantasy book, it's contemporary fiction and it's about a boy and a girl who are childhood friends and they decide to develop a video game together. So yeah, that's my book haul. So I'm gonna start some German classes. Um, if you guys are OGs, <laughs> you know that I was born in Germany, but I moved to Portugal when I was like four years old, so I can speak German because my parents kept speaking German to me and my sister at home. However, I'm not always great at grammar, <laughs> so I, I, and I do have to think a lot sometimes to form sentences, like more complicated sentences. So I'm right now doing a German quiz to determine the level at which I'm at, and then I'm gonna start doing some group German classes. Okay, I scored 24 out of 30. So they recommended B2.1 for me. There were a lot of grammar questions, <laughs> probably the ones I got wrong. 2, 1 they said, so... Okay, upper intermediate sounds good. Okay, my first class. So this is everything I have for you for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in my next one.